So it's the first week of the Advent season where we celebrate with anticipation the birth of our Savior, Jesus. This means that today we get to kick off a new series that we've titled Advent of a New Era. There's always so much great anticipation for Christmas to come, whether from a secular standpoint it's about getting presents or from us about the birth of our Savior, Jesus. Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection would bring about the advent of a new era, one defined by making the old new. We typically spend the weeks leading up to Christmas looking at the different components of Jesus' birth, but this year we want to instead look at what Jesus' coming means for us, how he makes the old new. There's something special and beautiful about making something old look new again. It's why people make a hobby out of refurbishing cars or a career out of remodeling old homes. But to make something new out of what already exists is much more difficult. To give what was created a new identity requires an extra layer of creativity and vision for what is being created. A number of years ago, my wife and one of her friends picked up a hobby where they would collect old wood. And I, I say hobby because there was no money made off of it, all right? But uh, no, they'd collect old wood and mostly pallet wood. They would make different signs and home decorations, and they called their little gig pen and pallet. Super cute, right? That's what they thought, all right? So here's kind of the kind of thing they would do. They would find this old pallet wood. They would uh, do some calligraphy on it and some, some different painting. A little show and tell here. And, uh, and they just had a lot of fun doing that together. But, so one of them would sand down, refurbish the wood. The other would paint on it. The end results would transform these broken, old, ugly, useless pieces of wood into a work of art. The pallet wood was no longer defined by what it was used for in the past, it became a new creation. It had a new identity, a new purpose. In a similar way, Jesus' birth would bring about, bring about the advent of a new era of making broken, ugly, flawed people have a new identity, become a new creation. Our scripture today comes from John 1, verses 9 through 13. And our scripture reader this week is Glow Gott. So Glow, can I have you move to the, uh, come to the center of the room for the reading? And then can I ask all that are able to please stand for the reading of God's word? And we stand and read from the center just to remind us of the centrality that scripture is supposed to have in our lives and that it's to be the primary lens to which we view the world around us. So Glow, whenever you're ready, go ahead. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Thanks, Glow. You can all be seated, please. Our scripture for today starts by talking about this true life, this true light that comes into the world. A light that would expose what was hiding and dwelling in the darkness. Humanity's sin and our sinful nature. This light that came into the world was Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. It says that even though God was with us here in this world, with his people, that many did not recognize who he was. But in verse 12, it says that those that did, those that believed in God's only son, Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. This right to become part of God's family came from this free gift of grace, which is rooted in his love for each and every one of us. Just as this gift and subsequent right was given to those who believed in Jesus, so too is that gift offered to us. 
we are offered that same identity when we put our faith in Jesus. Our scripture today is one that speaks to a transformation in identity. This identity is deeper than anything we tend to cling to here on this earth. Anything that culturally we consider to be our identity. It's one that defines who we are at our core. It's not rooted in the different talents that we have, our looks, our social status, our sexual identity, our career, or the political party that we align ourselves with. This identity supersedes and governs all other identities that we attach to ourselves. When we put our faith in Jesus, we're given a new identity. We become a child of God. But what does that mean? Aren't we already God's children? Well, yes, in that we're all created by and made in his image. But without Jesus, we are not considered a part of the family. We lack the perfection and holiness needed to share that DNA. What's being said is that those who receive Jesus are spiritually adopted to join the family of God. Today's passage says that we become a child, which means that before our belief, there was a different identity that defined us. To have a greater understanding of the significance of this new identity, it's important for us to understand the gravity and reality of our old. And this identity is described to us by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. It says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. It says that our identity before a belief in Jesus was one of being a slave to sin. Think about what that means. As much as we like to control every aspect of our lives, our identity is defined by our inability to do so. We cannot control it. It doesn't say that we're prone to sin, that we choose to sin, or that we like to sin. We're slaves to it. And we can't control how it impacts our lives. Now, being a slave to our sin is defined by our false sense of dependency for our desires to be fulfilled. This leads to us living a life that is centered around ourselves and what we want. It creates the mentality that as long as I'm happy, then what I'm doing is good. Being a slave to sin distorts our ability to discern our morality. It makes it easier for us to justify lying to our boss as to why we didn't make it into the office today. It makes it easier to flip off that driver that cut you off. It justifies us taking money under the table because times are really tight right now. And when we struggle to find intimacy with our spouse, it justifies the intimacy we find on the web. Before Jesus, we are slaves to our personal sin. But we also find ourselves slaves to the consequences of others' sin. As a slave to sin, we are slaves to the abuse that we've received, the lies that have been told about us, or the physical harm that's been done toward us. We're slaves to sin by the way that we allow for it to influence our lives and the standards it sets for how we think we're supposed to live. But because the gospel is real and the gospel changes everything, our identity is transformed from a slave to sin to a child of God. And when we dive into the contrast between these two identities, we see just how profound and meaningful this transformation really is. The identity that we find in Christ brings us from shackles to freedom. We're no longer bound to or restricted by our sin and our sinful nature. With our old identity, we were bound by our inability to resist our desires. And we just gave in to them. 
Sin had authority over our lives to deceive us into thinking that the sinful ways that we're living was how life was meant to be lived. It deceived us into believing that the trauma and affliction we've received from others or maybe even ourselves is what defines and controls who we are and how we live. The reality of the shackles we live with as a slave to sin also keep us restricted from having a relationship with the one true God. It's sometimes said that God cannot be in the presence of sin, but this isn't because God can't handle it. It's not like this kryptonite that God has. Oh, sin. It's that sin cannot withstand the holiness of God. And God is gracious to us by not submitting us to that when we are not worthy. Our sin doesn't make us free. It keeps us from the freedom of having a relationship with the living God. The deceptive irony of sin is that in the midst of living out our personal desires, we feel like we have so much freedom, we have so much control over what we're doing, but in reality, we're stuck. This kind of makes me think about the little toddler who uh, around Christmas time sees the Christmas cookies up on the top shelf. Now for me, it would be my mom's homemade scotcheroos. They're pretty great. So, you got this top shelf, and this child starts climbing up the shelf, gets to the top, has one scotcheroo, has two. If you're me, probably has six. That's four. I'm not good at math either, apparently. Now, your hands are sticky, and you look down and you realize, oh no, I can't get down. The so-called freedom that we felt we had is now our trap. We're stuck in our guilt, sticky-fingered. Sin deceives us into believing that its imprisonment is our freedom. But when we place our belief in Jesus, when we embrace this new identity, we find true freedom. Because of God's grace and forgiveness, we are given freedom from the mistakes of our past. We're given freedom from being bound to the ways that we've been afflicted. We no longer need to be held down or chained up by the consequences of sin. We can move forward with a greater sense of peace, not having to live in our shame and greater sense of hope for what the new identity that we have means for our eternity. In our freedom, God even gives us a gift to help. He gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit to guide, instruct, direct, and lead us towards living a life that embraces our freedom. As a child of God, we are no longer shackled by sin, but free of it. Now, this doesn't mean that we still don't deal with it or have it creep into our lives from time to time, but it no longer holds us down. It no longer controls us. Whether we're a slave to sin or a child of God, both identities involve someone or something ruling over us. But there's a huge contrast in the relational dynamic between the two. We go from being traded as a slave to becoming embraced as a part of God's family. As a slave to sin, we serve a master that is never appeased and always wants more from us. The kicker is while serving him, we also find no fulfillment, no satisfaction, just a constant chase for instant gratification to appease our brokenness and our hurt. As a slave, we have no value to our master other than what we can give to him. He doesn't care about what happens to us. To him, we are expendable. Our relationship is one-sided at best. We might love or care for the sin in our lives, but our sin could care less for us. At some point, it will beat us down. But as a child of God, we are adopted into his family. Under Roman law, during the time of Jesus, adoption meant transferring from one old authority to a new one. 
During this time, a son was considered the property of his father. He had no possessions of his own, and the father could sell him like he was a slave or even put him to death. Adoption transferred a son from the complete authority of one father to a new one. Because of this, the son, after this, had no, no longer had any inheritance of what the old father had. No longer had any of the debt of his old father. It was canceled. The adopted child would become one of the father's heirs and receive an inheritance. When we become a child of God, sin no longer has authority over us. Our debts are canceled. We no longer have to inherit sin's eternal consequences. And we're given a new and greater inheritance for an eternity in the presence of God. Instead of being a slave to sin, we become embraced like we're family. We're spiritually adopted as one of God's children. Instead of us not having value, not being cared about, and being expendable, we find ourselves worthy and dis- despite our flaws. And we find ourselves unconditionally loved and cared for. Forever cherished. With our new identity as a child of God, we go from shackles to freedom, slave to family. But another huge contrast between the old and new is that we go from death to life. As a slave to sin, we find ourselves buying into this illusion that we need to satisfy our momentary desires, the earthly things that make us happy in order to feel filled and fulfilled, to find life. We might start to believe that we can find life through extravagant vacations, making ourselves look younger and more beautiful, using our campers as much as possible, or going to every single soccer, basketball, volleyball tournament that we can. This attempt for life Now, all these things in themselves are not sin. But when we start to believe that they are what bring us life, when we start to elevate them as gods or idols in our lives, now we're talking sin. And the irony is that instead of life, sooner or later, we're brought down a road that ends, a road of death and destruction. Down the road, we'll run out of places to travel. Down the road, Father Time will eventually take our looks. Down the road, campers are going to break down. And we're only ever an injury away from not being able to play a sport. In Romans 6, 23, it says that the wages of sin is death. Sin leads us down a path of separation from God. And it does not create life. It brings death. Although giving in to it can be deceptively life-giving in the moment, it's fleeting and it's moral. And it causes us to go deeper and deeper down the road of depravity. But after saying that the wages of sin are death, the second half of Romans 6.23 says this, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. With our new identity as a child of God, we go from death to life. When we place our faith in Jesus, we are able to fully live life the way that we were supposed to, true living, in relationship with the holy God that loves us. True life comes when we receive God's gift of grace. It's experienced through peace, hope, love and joy that we can only find through our Savior Jesus. But the life that we get to experience is not just limited to this time here on the earth. Because of the resurrection of Jesus and our belief in him, we will one day be resurrected to be in the presence of God and be able to experience life to the fullest with him for eternity. We have so much reason this Christmas season to find peace, to be hopeful, to experience joy, and to feel loved. Because if we choose to put our faith in Jesus, we are no longer a slave to sin. 
but a child of God. As we live into this new identity, we should begin to see ourselves transformed in the way that we conduct ourselves. After the Apostle Paul finished talking about us no longer being slaves to sin, he would go on to say in Romans 6, 12 through 14, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. With our new identity, we're challenged to conduct ourselves in a way that reflects who we truly are. Paul tells us that we are to resist the sin in our lives. We're to do all we can to cut it out. We just talked about sin for the last 10 weeks. We're always going to be tempted by it, but it no longer rules us, so fight it. But do not try to do it alone. First go to God. Give him your struggles. Let him give you the strength. Let him walk with you. Instead of listening to sin's influence, follow instead the leading of the Holy Spirit. Paul also says to us to offer every part of ourselves as an instrument of righteousness. This means that in our conduct, we are to reflect the righteousness of Christ. When we do this, we become an amazing instrument for the advancement of God's kingdom. When we reflect his obedience, morality, and humility, people are going to take notice. They're going to notice a difference in how it is we live and the way that, that we impact the world around us. When we become a bearer of his peace, hope, love, and joy, we get to partner with him in bringing heaven to earth. The beauty of reflecting Jesus is that we can start by doing it simple and subtle. It can start with kindness to someone we normally wouldn't give the time of day to. Apologizing when we're wrong. Forgiving others when we've been wronged. Spending 15 minutes a day with God, whether through prayer or through his word. Or it can be making a phone call to that person you know is struggling. Paul finishes by saying that sin shall no longer be our master because we are not under the law, but under grace. In essence, he's telling us to remember who we are. Now, I'm a child of the 90s, and so there's a movie called The Lion King that came out, and Mufasa becomes this big cloud guy, and Simba's really struggling with his identity, and he goes to Simba, he says, remember who you are. That was pretty good, right? It's pretty good. But that's how it is. So often we get distracted by thinking we have to give into what the world's given us when we just have to remember who we are. Remember, we don't have to be controlled by our impulses and temptation, that we can go directly to God for help. Remember that we've been given the gift of grace and we are no longer shackled down with shame. Remember that we're loved and cherished children of a holy God. I think many of us here, and I find myself in this category sometimes, we develop a case of forgotten identity. It can be easy for us to lose our way and start finding our identity in some of these earthly, worldly ways that come so easy to us. But it's never too late to remember who you are. Who you are through Christ. It's never too late to repent of your sin and to turn your direction back towards God. This is true because we have been adopted as one of his beloved children. And he is a good and faithful father. The birth of Jesus would bring about the advent of a new era, one that would make the old new. And today we get to celebrate the birth of our Savior 
because he transformed our old identity as a slave to sin to an embraced, loved child of God. Please pray with me. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the truth that it brings us and the reminders it gives us. God, I ask that today, if there's people here who have put their faith in you, but they've forgotten who they are, that you would help them remember. Lord, help them to live into that identity that you give them as a loved child of God. And Lord, if there's people here today that have never made that decision, they're still figuring out who they are, Lord, that you would bring them to you that you would allow for them to embrace this free gift of grace and take up their new identity. It's in your name we pray, amen. Let's close with this blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope and the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen.